But anyway, as usual, before I introduce to you Steve Pulio, who is today's speaker, I do want to just mention a couple of upcoming events. The Council on Aging has an event on November 17th. The topic is, Lisa, where are you? The Black right, Holes, right? Black Hole Initiative. Everyone there you go. Everyone who's hearing about it, uh, they found the Black Hole. The people who found it are speaking here. Ooh, Good. November 17th. Well. So come on, join us, spread the word. And the Council on Aging is a co-sponsor of today's event, along with the, uh, the library. And we're always welcome to have both of them co-sponsoring our events. The Historical Society yeah. has two events upcoming. The next one of these lectures is on Sunday, November 3rd. Bob Began will be talking about the rescue of the USS Squalus, the first successful submarine rescue in uh, the history of the world. That is Sunday, November 3rd. On Saturday, October 19th, there is a walking tour of Wellesley Square. Uh, two of us will be leading the walking tour around Wellesley Square. For those of you who haven't done it, it's excellent. I think you will enjoy it. And, uh, the fee is, I think, a grand total of $5. So um, hopefully that won't bankrupt any of you. Um, the third thing that I'm very reluctant to mention is the fact that tomorrow, you can't hear me back there? No, no. Sorry about that. The fee for the walking tour is only $5 if you're not. If you're not a member, if you're a member, it is free. One of the many benefits of membership in the Women's <laughs> Historical Society. And indeed, we have our newsletter sitting over there on the table if you want to see some of the others. That's important. I'm also very reluctant to mention one more thing, although my friend Marion Stevens is here from the Wellesley Weston Lifetime Learning Center. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, there is a lecture on 1919, a year of violence and unrest in America, which it most assuredly was. I'm reluctant to mention it only because I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> and it is over at the uh, community center. It's the new venue for the Wellesley Lifetime Learning. Yeah, couple here, just and um, as I said, you it's 10 o'clock tomorrow yeah, morning. For so. those of you who don't have to work on Monday morning, God love you. OK, once again, so I do not forget to acknowledge the Council on Aging is a co-sponsor today. And the Wellesley Library and the person of Kathy Fetcher is also a co-sponsor today. Now, for the reason you're all here, which is most assuredly not to listen to me, um, and it is to listen to Steve Pulio. Steve is our coming back for the third time. He has spoken to us previously on the King of uh, Senator Sumner and also on the Great Molasses Flood in 1919 in Boston, a book I have recently reread as part of the speech I have to give tomorrow. It's a great book. Today, Stephen is going to be speaking, as all of you know. In a second, after I put these chairs out. <laughs> we, we, we like to put our speakers to work. We don't want them getting kind of lackadaisical and thinking we're just here to serve them. <laughs> Well, we'll wait till we get all the chairs out. By the way, this is the largest crowd I think I've seen in here in the 10 years I've been running the speaker series. And that is a wonderful tribute to, uh, to Steve Pulio for sure. There you go. Okay, we all set on chairs? Everybody has a seat and one. You guys, you guys good? Everybody got a seat? Good. All right, here he is, Steve Pulio. Well, 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 oh, wait, you've got Sorry. You see what happens when you get a little flow crowd. <laughs> All right. Steve uh, basically has recently retired from what used to be his day job in public relations and corporate communications. Now dedicates himself full time to writing history, as you can see. He has written books on a wide variety of topics. The Caning of Charles Sumner, which led up, helped lead up to the Civil War. The Great Molasses Flood in Boston, which was a major disaster in 1919. He wrote about one of the warships, American warships, in World War II. He's written a book on Boston in the late 19th century that is wonderful. And he has written, most not most recently, but most relevant to today, a book on Italian immigration to Boston. And I, I enjoy this topic, especially today, as we are once again going through America's periodic re-examination of our views on immigration. And as we are once again, not once again, but for the first time, looking at the whole issue of the naming of Columbus Day, of course, the great Italian explorer from Genoa, 
I think this talk today is perhaps more relevant than, uh, than it could ever be. So now, with no further ado, I give you Steve Bullion. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, can you guys hear me OK in the back? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I, just a little housekeeping thing. If you have your cell phones on, could you silence those? That would be fantastic. And if you have any issues hearing or there's like a little echo I still hear, let me know if we have to fix things. We'll try to do that. But I think most, mostly we're in good shape. Thanks to Kathy with her great efforts on the sound system. And John, thanks for the tremendous introduction. Listen, I don't know much about the black hole. I can tell you that. Like, so you should come to that. I would like to come to that. But I do know about the USS Squalus, Squalus however you want to pronounce it when you get a chance. Fantastic rescue, fantastic story. Please come for that. I'm very, very familiar. It's like the first bell dive, uh, bell dive that they pulled sailors off the bottom of the ocean out of the sub. So really important. I want to say 1939. I think I'm right about that, right before the Second World War. So really a worthwhile topic. Today, again, my appreciation to Wellesley for the turnout. Really, really do appreciate it. Um, when, when John and I first booked this thing, and you know, you book these things months in advance, and I have the Patriots schedule in front of me. <laughs> I mean, I'm a Patriot season ticket holder, and my wife and I have been season ticket holders for 25 years. So, you know, I have the schedule, and when I book events, that schedule's in front of me. So I said to him, you sure you want to go head to head with the Patriots game? He said, yes, we'll still have a good turnout. And I said, okay, fine. So this is phenomenal, beyond my wildest expectations. I really, I really do appreciate that. And then when it was a beautiful day, when the day broke this morning, at least on the South Shore where I live, it was gorgeous. You know, the dirty little secret that librarians don't often say to you is in the fall and in the spring, because they don't do much programming in the summer, not much. But in the fall and in the spring, on a weekend day, right, they hope it rains a little bit. <laughs> they do, because a really good day keeps the crowd down. So, as I drove north to Wellesley, it was getting cloudier and cloudier. I'm like, good, excellent. It's the only time you wish for sort of a cloudy day. So uh, I'm going to talk about the Italians, the Boston Italians, um, my heritage, just so you guys know up front. My book, The Boston Italians, is a historical look at the Italian experience in Boston, which is pretty much mirrored by the Italian experience in most cities across the United States. But it's also the Puglio story. I'm the grandson of three Italian immigrants. Uh, my paternal grandparents came here from Sicily. Uh, Shaka is the name of the town, which was a small fishing village. Now it's a lot bigger. And my maternal grandfather came from Avellino. My maternal grandmother was born here. So I'm just giving you that background because it comes up in my, my story, really epitomizes the Italian-American story. So before I go any further, Anybody with Italian-American heritage right here in this room? OK, excellent. Like two-thirds of the people. Wellesley has this great tradition, great Italian-American tradition, as many towns around here do. So when I talk about this story of the Italians, very close to my heart, but also I also define this story as what I would call the epitome of the American dream. The Italian experience is the epitome of the American dream. So what do we mean by that? This story, you know, when you think about it, a little over 100 years old, really, to speak, right? The great Italian migration, and most of it's from the south. So draw a line at Rome, it goes south. Most of it's from the south. About 80% of the Italians who come to the United States come from the south. That great migration comes between about 1890 and the start of the First World War. Now, there's exceptions, of course, but that's the great. And really, 1890 to 1910 is the real big, big migration. But after the First World War, during the war, it trickles. Immigration in general just slows to a trickle, almost nothing. After the war, there are a couple of more big years. That's when my maternal grandfather came in 1921. And then immigration restrictions go into place, and so it kind of slams the door. But for the most part, World War I ends the great Italian migration to the United States. So when you think about that, it's a pretty short time, 100 years plus, still over 100 years. When you think about the progress Italians, Italian Americans have made in that period, it is a pretty amazing story. So think about the people who came here, that first generation, that immigrant generation. And by the way, almost every Italian American that I know, that I've spoken to, that I research, 
Anybody who's had any success, and you can define success any way you want, job success, entrepreneurial success, family success, charitable, humanitarian success, any, any way you want, almost every single Italian American I talk to traces it back to that first generation, that inspiration from that first immigrant generation, whether it's their grandparents, great grandparents, great great parent, grandparents, parents, you name it. And some of the hardships they overcame. Now think about this group that came. About four, five million Italians come to the United States. They flee southern Italy, we'll talk about that. About 15 million people in all flee southern Italy, about five million go to other parts of Europe, about five million go to South America, mostly Argentina, and about five million come here, roughly speaking. That's how it breaks out. Think about it. The vast majority of them, and I mean statistically almost 100% of them, could not speak English. The vast majority of them are dirt poor, and my, again, my paternal grandfather is right in this demographic came here with $12 in his pocket, which is all he had, and that's very, very typical for Italian immigrants. The vast majority were illiterate in their own language. We'll get to that, what that means. But none of them could, in the words of my 89-year-old mother, speak the real Italian, right? They spoke dialects, regional dialects to this day. If I say to my mother, he or she was fluent in Italian, she says, wait, the real Italian? Yes, <laughs> yes. But the vast majority of them, illiterate in their own language. The majority of them unskilled, those from the south. You had many artisans and craftsmen from the north, much fewer from the south. 55, 60% of the Italian immigrants who came here started as pick and shovel laborers give you that kind of baseline. Yeah. And, and because they had very dark skin, as I said, most of them Southern Italians, Sicilians, most of them faced great discrimination when they came here, not just as immigrants, but from a racial standpoint. The Southern Italians were, all, were almost considered another race. In the words of one foreman that I quote in my book who says, I will hire anybody as long as they're good in, at their job, whether they be white, black, or Southern Italian. <laughs> so they were almost a different race when they came here. So they had to kind of overcome those great odds as well. But Italian Americans will tell you, and they'll tell you with pride, and they'll tell you with truth and accuracy, that this is not a story of succumbing to odds. It's a story of overcoming odds, right? Today, Italian Americans far exceed the national average as doctors, lawyers, uh, CEOs, entrepreneurs, people in business school, people in med school, you name it, any of those professions, right? These are people who were once bricklayers, once barbers, once bakers. That's what they were. Now they're software engineers, they're senators, right? They've accomplished a great deal in a relatively short time. So you say to yourself, how do they do that? I think they do that by a combination of the opportunities they got here, their willingness to work very hard, their loyalty to family, not so much different from a lot of other immigrant groups, and their ability to overcome various phases of discrimination that I will talk about. And again, that's part of the story, certainly not the whole story, but part of the story. So when you think about this group of people, you think about who were they? Who is this group that decided to tear, uh, tear up their roots and go across the ocean? Most of these people had never left their village, their little town hamlet, their little fishing village. Never got that far. Very lucky if they ever, ever rode on a train they rode by donkey, they walked, carts. That's who we're talking about. That's who we're talking about. Barely made it past the kind of confines of their very comfortable village. <coughs> Through their dialect, that's about it. 
That's who they are. They come for a variety of reasons. Some not that much different than immigrants today. Some different. I mean, there's a difference in the experience. We'll talk about that. But they come because the situation in southern Italy at the time was horrendous. There's this confluence of events, uh, natural disasters, discrimination from Rome in the north, weather issues, economic issues, all combined to make things terrible in southern Italy. This series of monsoons and droughts has a real terrible impact on the citrus industry in the south allows the United States citrus business to gain a real toehold on the national, I mean, in the international market. Almost puts the Italians out of business from a citrus point of view. Vineyards, same thing. Combination of monsoon and droughts allow the French to really get the toehold in the wine industry, become leaders in the wine industry. The southern Italian wine industry is devastated for several decades in the south. They face discrimination in their home country. Why is that? Think about your history. Italy is not unified as a country, a single country, until 1860, about the time of the American Civil War. Before that, you had the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies in the south, the Papal States in the middle, the Bourbons in the north. You had these very strange combinations. Garibaldi brings them all together as a single country in 1860. Fascinating the way it happens. You should definitely read about that separately. Fascinating the way it happens. But many in Rome, many in the North, resented the fact that these poor, uneducated, uncultured people in the South, farmers, peasants, were now considered Italian. That pizza versus polenta rivalry <laughs> starts in Italy with the north and the south. There are some priests in the Catholic Church who wouldn't even serve communion to southern Italians because they resented that they were called Italians, that they were part of Italy. And so in the south, they felt that as well. Then you have these natural disasters, Mount Vesuvius, Mount Etna, earthquakes, you know, these kinds of things. All of this combination leads many southern Italians to think that their region is cursed. And so they make this very difficult decision to leave. And when they first make the decision, when they first make the decision, they mostly don't do it permanently. They go back and forth to the United States and come back. They're called birds of passage in a very disparaging way. They, they don't make a commitment to the United States initially. My great father went back once, back and forth once. Some people did it as many as 10 times. But that whole character of the immigration changes right around 1905, visibly changes. My great father came in 1906. He's one of those big years of migrants that come here permanently. But right around 1905, that birds of passage thing tends to almost stop. Again, statistically, there's a few exceptions, but it almost stops. Italians have finally made this decision. Enough people have gone back and forth. There's been some writing back and forth. Italians who have come here have sent money back to southern Italy. They've made this decision that as emotionally difficult as it is to leave the old country, and it was very emotionally difficult, the economic reasons were too strong. As one immigrant said, there was always bread in America. As tough as the times were when they first came, there was always bread in America, not the case in southern Italy. And that emotion, you know, that emotion is very, very real. As I said, they walked, they took donkeys, they might have taken a train to the great embarkation ports, Naples, Palermo, et cetera. And there was this tradition they had that uh, when, when an Italian who was getting on the ship would carry a ball of yarn and leave the end of the ball of yarn with somebody who stayed on shore. And as the ship pulled away, that ball of yarn would unravel. They'd hold on to that connection as long as they could. And then they both would let go. 
and that piece of yarn now would go up on the wind. So it was this very emotional, trying moment when they left. And they leave, and they come to the United States. And about that same 80%, I told you 80%, four out of five came from the South, that same four out of five settles in cities. A quarter do the mining thing out in western Pennsylvania and Ohio, and some go south to farming, etc. But four out of five of them go to American cities. And in some ways, this kind of traumatic experience moving from farms and hillsides and fishing villages to crowded tenement slums, which is what the North End was, is almost as traumatic as the move from Italy to the United States in the first place. Very, very different way of living. And so what did Italians do when they came here? How did they settle? How did they ease this burden? They settled according to the regions from which they left. There's a very ironic part of Italian immigration in that Italians did not consider themselves Italians until they came to America. Let me say that again. <laughs> Italians did not consider themselves Italians until they came to America. Very different, even from the Irish. You could be from County Mayo, you could be from Roscommon, you could be from any of the, any of the, uh, of the counties, but you would still consider yourself an Irishman when you came here. Not so with the Italians. You were a Calabrian, a Villanese, a Sicilian. You, know, you name it. You guys are all nodding your heads and laughing because you know you've heard these stories. And, you, and it is still true to some extent. So you would, you would settle in these American cities according to these regions that you came from. So you take a place like the North End, which is what I feature in the book. It's the quintessential Italian neighborhood. The North End is about, physically speaking, a little over a square mile. That's it. That's it. Square mile of inhabitable space at the time. So I'm taking out right along Commercial Street and Atlantic Avenue, which were, the, which were the old warehouses, now the incredibly expensive condos, by the way. <laughs> but about a square mile of inhabitable space, 40,000 people in there, um, in the North End at its peak, about 40,000 people. And in the North End, there were various streets, so down in Fleet Street, down that way, that was where the Sicilians and the fishermen were, and the Villanese were here and the Calabrians were here. Now, my dad grew up in the North End. His family, he's the baby of 10. And he said, oftentimes, we would be hanging out on the corner, and we'd see somebody who wasn't a Sicilian, and we'd say, what are you doing down here? <laughs> down here is like a minute and a half away <laughs> in the North End. It's right up, it's right over there. It takes you a minute and a half to walk it. You can walk the whole North End from one end to the other in a little less than 15 minutes, if you have a good gait. It was a very, very strange, I tell a story in my book of a Sicilian who is married to a woman from Avellino. He comes here and he passes as Villanese for almost 25 years. He's walking the streets of the North End at one time, and a Sicilian from Zaragoza comes to the North End, sees him, and outs him as a Sicilian. <laughs> And he said, you know, boy, if I hadn't already established my business and my reputation among the Villanese, I could have been in real trouble. So that kind, that kind of segmentation helps the Italians ease their way here, make that transition here. Think about this. I want you to think about this. There are two great Italian immigrant churches in the North End. Sacred Heart Church and St. Leonard's Church. St. Leonard's the first Italian-American parish in all of New England. 1876, by the way, very early. But anyway, of those two parishes, they did about 20,000 marriages during the Great Immigration <coughs> Period. At one point, they were doing about 11 to 12 marriages a week and about 40 christenings a week, by the way. <coughs> So they did 20,000 marriages. Again, four out of five of those were from people from the same region, the Paese. 
of Paisan. Right? That's what we mean. Same village, same region. Four out of five. Only six of them, only six of them were between northern Italians and southern Italians. I'm not saying 600. I'm saying one, two, three, four, five, six of 20,000 were between northern and southern Italians. Now, 18 of them, 18 of those marriages were between Italians and non-Italians. So do the math. Italians marry non-Italians at three times the rate that northerners married sons. <laughs> That's what we're talking about when we talk about the Italian experience. So it has its good points and its bad points, right? Everything in history, right, is, it, it, you know, there's never, really, there's never really all of one or all the other. It has its good points and its bad points. The good points is it does make this transition a little easier. So Italians in the North End, in their little regional areas, yes, when they ventured out of the North End, they did have to learn English. They had to be with somebody who knew English or learn English themselves. When they came back to the enclave, they could speak their dialect. No problem. So that kind of helps. But what it hurts, what it hurts Italians is in the political field. It hurts them from voting as a bloc. Italians do not vote, again, let's use the Irish because Italians is the second largest ethnic group that come to Boston, the Irish are the largest. They do not vote as a bloc for a long time. There is no real Italian vote until, uh, I'd say around the years of the Depression, in the 30s, right in the early Roosevelt years, let's say, right in there. Because they have these little fiefdoms, these little tribal paeses that they are loyal to, so they don't come together. Take some time to do that. I had, I had people, when the book first came out, Tom Menino was the mayor of Boston, and they'd say, oh, that's interesting, he's an Italian-American mayor. When, who was the first Italian-American mayor? I said, Tom Menino. Like in 1993, they're like, really? You have this great Italian tradition, but you don't, you never had an Italian-American mayor. Nope, that's one of the reasons why. One of the reasons why. Other reason, Italians come over here very mistrustful and distrustful of government. They came here, they worked very hard, but they kept their heads low. Now there's exceptions. There was an Italian anarchist movement that was very busy, very violent, right? Sacco and Vanzetti's comrades, all of that piece. There's a very small piece of the Italian experience related to organized crime. We'll talk about that. But for the most part, Italians do keep their heads down. They are not civically involved. They're involved in the arts. They're involved in restaurants as time goes on. They're involved in many, many great things. They are not much involved with government. They distrust it. They've just come from southern Italy, where they've totally been abused, practically. So it takes them a little while to get going. They distrust the Catholic Church from the day. They experience some discrimination in southern Italy. They come here. Most of the church hierarchy at the time is Irish. The Irish hate the way the Italians practice the religion. They consider it too pagan-like. You're carrying a saint through the streets of Boston. <laughs> You're attaching money to that saint? <laughs> Outrageous. Outrageous. So there was that kind of friction. You will see pictures. You will see pictures. I've seen dozens of them. You will see pictures during the great immigration period outside of the Sacred Heart Church where Italian men on a Sunday morning would be sitting outside of the church while their wives and children went to mass. They resented. They would not go to mass. They'd go to funerals. They'd go to wakes. They'd go to christenings. They would not go to mass on a regular basis. That's part of the background for that. So they come here, despite all of this, despite how different it is here, despite the issues, they work very, very hard. What is their number one goal? To own a home, to work hard and own a home. Most of them owned nothing in the old country. They worked the farm. Let's call them tenant farmers. Well, they rented as they were fishermen. 
but home ownership was a big deal among Italians. By the First World War, I want you to keep this stat in mind. I don't do a lot of stats, but I think some are important. By the First World War, 25% of the buildings in the North End were owned by Italians. It's a lot. One out of four. They worked extremely hard to do that. A home was something that could not be taken away. So it was a priority for them. But there's a yin and a yang to that, too. What is it? What is it? The older children of the Italian immigrants often left school early to work and contribute to the family. Italians did not place a premium on formal education at the time. Some people say to me, this is the first book of the Italian experience in Boston. Why is that? Come out, this book came out in 2007. Why is that? Because it took Italians a long time to realize the power of the written word and the importance of the written word in getting their story down. Again, very different from the Irish, very different from Jews who considered it a priority to get that down. In Italians, those of you in Italian family know this is true, stories got passed down. They're oral histories. They're very rich. They're very interesting. They're almost always wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, they're almost always wrong. I mean, my mother will tell me the story of somebody who passed away. How did they pass away? I'm not quite sure. I heard this, I heard that. You come to find out it wasn't any of those. You know, I mean, I was 14 years old before I realized a guy I used to call uncle was not my uncle, but my father's friend. Dear friend of my father, great guy, tremendous sense of humor, finally realized, wait, where does he fit in dad's pecking order? Oh, he's not really his brother. He's a friend. So these stories are wonderful, and they're rich but they weren't passed down in a formal way for the most part. Italians don't do that until about the Second World War. Again, there's exceptions. So these poor folks who are also kind of the children of like Dante and Michelangelo and all of these great Western kind of artists, the writing part for the Southern Italians doesn't happen until about the Second World War. That's where we're talking about. On this, on this time frame. It takes a long time to get that down. And so what does that do? It kind of delays Italians in professions, in college graduates. I'm the first college graduate in my family. I'm 65. First college graduate in my family. Not unusual at all in this story. So just keep that in mind. That's all part of this wonderful Italian tapestry. So Italians keep making progress well into the 20s. They're actually, even though the North End is still a pretty poor neighborhood, Italians are buying more property and making good progress. They're, they've improved their lot from pick and shovel laborers. Now they think they're doing things like opening their own business, which by the way, is one of the things you do if you don't have a formal education. You become an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship, very important among Italians. They became tradesmen and craftsmen. My maternal grandfather becomes, after five years here, a wonderful cobbler. Comes here as a pick and shovel labor, learns the cobbler trade, becomes a cobbler, did beautiful shoe work when he was here. So that happens very quickly. It's happening in the midst of what I'll call the assimilation discrimination that happened against Italians. In the 20s, it was very, very tough. Even the fight game, which was an Irish game at that time, boxing, kind of an Irish fight game, Italian fighters would change their names to Irish names because that's the only way they could get ahead. So you'd have a boxing match, right, But between John Delaney and Kid O'Toole, except Kid O'Toole was a Sicilian immigrant, right? <laughs> now, both sides knew, the Italians and the Irishmen knew what it was. Frank Sinatra's father boxed in Hoboken, under an Irish name, for example. So that kind of stuff happened all the time into the 20s. Very important. But Italians kept making these struggles. And even during the Depression, very, very difficult for all ethnic groups. You've heard the stories, most of them true. Put newspapers in your shoes, all of those things, all true. But Italians in the North End and in Boston 
do relatively speaking do okay during the depression because they were good savers because they were hard workers, because they took in borders to their property to help with the rent, or if they owned homes to help with the sort of monthly uh, nut that they had to pay. And as we approach the Second World War, as we approach the Second World War, Italians now have to deal with their second major discrimination piece that comes at them. And that's this, after Mussolini throws in with Hitler, there's great questions about whether Italian Americans, if we were to get into a war, whether Italian Americans could fight for the United States, could go overseas, and maybe kill their good friends or their family members. Would they be fifth columnists here in the United States? Lots of fears. Lots of fears about that. In early 1942, you all know of FDR's Executive Order 966, which takes China, um, Japanese American citizens and moves them to camps. Not just immigrants, but citizens, some second and third generation. Well, for non-citizen Italians and for non-citizen Germans, they had to go down and register as enemy aliens. OK, this is part of that same executive order. I have my grandmother, who didn't become an, a citizen um, ever, not unusual at all for Italian women at that time. I have my grandmother's enemy alien card. She had to do her little thumbprint um, on that and go down when she first got it. It's implemented in February of 42. At that point, one of her sons was already in the United States Army, right after Pearl Harbor, a couple months after Pearl. She eventually would have three sons in the army, my dad, one of them. That enemy alien designation lasts until October of 42. October of 42. When FDRs uh, and his staff and his political handlers and all of that realize that such as an, such as an Italian vote as there <coughs> is, was outraged and in the midterm elections of 42 might not vote Democrat because of this. So he gets rid of that executive order on Columbus Day of 42. <laughs> so that enemy alien designation for Italians and Germans by that point is gone. And so what happens? About 1.5 million Italian Americans fight on the side of the United States in the Second World War very bravely. That's about 10%, a little under 10% of the total 16 million men in uniform that we had then. And they dispel that whole notion. They dispel it completely. If I bravely, that whole notion of patriotism goes away when they're in foxholes with people from all around the country and from just different nationalities, ethnic groups, religions, and you name So much so. Think about this, so much so, but to, to the extent that art imitates life. If you watch a World War II movie from the late 40s and the early 50s, I urge you to do this. There's hundreds of them that are made, hundreds of them. The Italian-American kid from Brooklyn is always a character in every platoon, squad, you name it. Usually it's played by Sal Mineo, maybe Sinatra. And I'm just saying to you, that's part and parcel of that whole experience. So Italians come home, Italian Americans come home in 45, 46, and they begin to do what a lot of immigrant groups and a lot of Americans in general do. What do they start doing in the 40s and in the 50s and in the early 60s? They start to move out of the city. They start to move out of Boston. We'll use Boston now, but this is, this is replicated in cities around the country. They get the GIs get the GI Bill. They can buy homes. They can go to college. All of that. And in the North End, you have the double, um, you have the double whammy of the West End is destroyed. The central artery goes through Boston and separates the North End from the rest of the city. There's all this upheaval in the late 50s. And Italians begin to move on. Now, they move everywhere, including Wilson, but I'm just saying they move everywhere. But most Italians go 
just a little bit north and west, right? They go to Revere, Everett, Malden, Medford, Chelsea. Do I have to name your town? Did I get, did I get them all? <laughs> Melrose, Stoneham. And then they go all the way to Burlington, where I grew up. Now, let me tell you something. When my, fam when my dad moved us, I was two and a half years old when we moved to Burlington. To Burlington. My uh, paternal grandmother was furious with him. Where is Burlington? How far away is it? How am I going to get there? Isn't that a place people go on vacation? <laughs> it's 20 minutes away. I mean, then it was 40 minutes away. Now it's 20 from Burlington, the north end. She was, she was furious. I remember these, you know, I'm sure you guys can relate to this. I remember these, um, these huge Sunday extravaganzas. So obviously we'd mostly go see our grandparents, but then there was always this moment, this day, when they were coming to Burlington. So of course none of them drove. So my dad used to like schlep in at seven o'clock in the morning to the North End, get them, bring them back. We'd have a nice day, we'd have dinner, then he'd schlep back to the North End, drop them off, come back, exhausted from Monday work. But you know, that's how it was done those days. And so that was always a big moment when they came up. But this notion, this notion, my mic just went off, can you hear me? Okay, this notion of moving to the suburbs and moving away from that central family was unheard of. My grandmother didn't know what to do with it. You're moving far away. And that's true of almost every Italian that moved out of the city. That happens throughout. This is when you hear, around the 70s, you hear, the North End is changing. That's what you hear from people who live there. That's what you hear from people who have already moved out of there. And literally, it's true. The demographics are changing. They've changed remarkably. The North End is still maybe 35% Italian. If there's an Italian enclave in Boston, it is the North End. But that change happens, really accelerates in the 70s. And Italians move out. To the extent that if you were to take a squeegee at I-495 and squeegee all the way down to Provincetown, you would scoop up somewhere between 850,000 and 900,000 people with Italian American heritage in that eastern Massachusetts area. It's huge. And Italians do what so many other ethnic groups do. They move into the suburbs. They become selectmen, mayors. They join the VFW. They join the American Legion. They become school principals and school superintendents. And you I remember the story. I had somebody in one of my presentations who remembers when the first Italian family moved in to their neighborhood. Sometime in the late 50s. This guy was a paper boy in the late 50s. And he said, I'm of Scottish heritage. We're very reserved. I go to collect one day. I'm here to collect. They say, come on in. And what's the first thing the mom says? What is the first thing? You guys know it. Say it. Do you want to eat? <laughs> Would you like something to eat? The guy says, I didn't know what to do. Do I want to eat? What do you mean? I don't even know you. <laughs> but he kind of told that story in such an endearing way of how Italian Americans changed his neighborhood for the better, changed his suburban neighborhood for the better. And they do that. They do that during the 70s, right? During the third and last big Italian discrimination thing that happened in the United States. What happens in 1972? Who knows the answer? The God Godfather is released. So Godfather changes, changes culture, changes the perception of Italian Americans. Now, by the way, before you get all upset, I love The Godfather. <laughs> I've watched it hundreds of times. I can't, I, when it comes on cable, I, get, I can't, my voice like, you have this on again? <laughs> I know every single line in The Godfather, the big lines, the little lines, like take the gun, leave the cannolis, I know it all. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not in any way trying to suggest you should enjoy, you should like it, but it does change the dynamic 
in the perception towards Italian Americans in the United States. Some of that happened during the Kafalfa hearings in the 50s. Some of it happened during the Giovalacci hearings of the 60s. But it is the Godfather movie that completely transforms that and kind of puts forth the notion that almost everybody with an Italian American surname must be connected to the mob in some way, must be connected to organized crime in some way. To this day, although I think it's gotten better in the last 10 years since The Sopranos went off the air, <laughs> to this day, that is still a perception. I know this, that in 2005, Princeton did a poll in which three quarters of American teenagers thought every Italian American had a connection to organized crime. That's 2005, 2005, so that's pretty recent. So that issue, if you're of Italian American heritage, is kind of still with us. And I always tell Italian Americans, like, how do you deal with that? Yes, the mafia is part of our story. Yes, organized crime is part of our story. It's on the periphery of our story. How do we get to tell this real story of how hard my grandparents worked? how they work their fingers to the bone to run this business, to support their family. How do we do that? I say you do it, you do it in a reasonable way and you can do it. So I, I have, you know, in my, in Way I lived in Weymouth, when the Boston Italians was coming out, a person who was a town councilor in Weymouth, we have a town council, a mayor and town councilors, who's running for the town council, knew, knew I was a writer, knew I was an author, said, well, you're working on, I said, I'm working on a book about Italian Americans. He says, is it a book about the mob? <laughs> I said, Jack, no, it isn't a book about the mob. Here's what it's about. And I walk them all the way through. Oh, yeah, 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 no offense. No, none taken. <laughs> In my day job, John was talking about my day job is uh, doing public relations communications. We did a lot of sales support where we'd get into a room and we'd say, OK, how do we strategize? How do we message against this other company? And there was one other company had this great person, just a star. We're like, what do we do about, what do we do about him? You know, he's better than anything. We got blah, blah, blah. There's like nine of us in the room. The vice president of sales says to me, says to the group, I'm in the room, maybe we can have one of Puglio's relatives take out a contract on him. <laughs> true story. 100% true story. So I don't say anything. Afterwards, I pull him aside. I say, John, his name is John, by the way. I say, John, I wish you wouldn't say stuff like that. You can't imagine how offensive it is. John, I'm good friends with him. By the way, I'm good friends with him still. John's face just drops. He goes, oh my god, Steve. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean anything by it. No, I didn't mean any offense. If I knew it was going to hurt you or offend you in any way, never would have said it. I said, no, no, we're good. I just never said it again. But I said to my wife, I don't know what's worse, the fact that he said it, or he, he didn't think that would bother me at all. You know, it's kind of like just taken. And that is, that's the residue of that, again, one of the greatest movies of all time, but I'm saying that starts that, that kind of notion. So I say to people when they're in that situation, just quietly, you don't need to get into someone's face, you don't need to just quietly tell the story of that first generation, right? That first generation who came over here with nothing and built what we have today. And if you tell the story, to me, like that's the best way that you can get across the whole Italian-American experience. And that's the best way you can pay tribute to that, to that generation, right? But that's the first, kind of the original greatest generation. The greatest generation normally, you know, my dad's generation, the World War II generation. But it's that first immigrant generation, I think, that really sets the tone, really clears the way for the Italian-American experience. So I'd say, that's how you can tell it. And again, Italian-Americans don't present this as succumbing to those odds. They present it as overcoming those odds. But there were lots of odds to overcome. Keep that in mind. Thanks. And now we're going to do questions. My favorite part of the whole thing. So let's go. Thank you so much. And when we do questions, guys, I will tell you this. Um, you could ask you know, about the book, about publishing, about agents, about research. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty open in that kind, of, that kind of way. And if I can hear it, you'll hear it. I'll repeat the questions so there's no need to strain or anything like that. 
So let's get started and we'll see where it takes us. Yes, ma'am. So how do you feel about the renaming of Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Day? Yeah, so how do I feel about the renaming of Columbus Day as Indigenous People Day? Thank you for getting me right into that. <laughs> appreciate that. Appreciate that controversy and that kind of No, so here's how I come down about this, right? I, I, I know this story well. I know Columbus's story well. I know the debate well. I think you can do both. And, and to be honest with you, I think you should do both. I, I, don't, I know you guys are, are you guys in the midst of debating this now? I don't. Well, actually, we are debating in the town oh. of Wellesley, and we do have a petition which proposes a joint celebration of Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day on the second Monday of October. Did you guys hear that? No. Okay. So I think you can do both. And so here's, here's what I mean by that. We celebrate Columbus because he's a fantastic navigator. There's no question it's indisputable. He made four voyages here, came back, made four voyages, before there was longitude, for crying out loud. Before there was longitude. He's a remarkable navigator, leader, prevented mutiny on a couple of his voyages because people weren't sure where the heck they were going and was there anything out here, etc., etc., etc. Did he exploit and enslave indigenous peoples? Yes, he did. But I, I'm one of these people that doesn't think you make Columbus responsible for the entire 15th century. I think that's an issue. I think that's a real problem. I think, I think, I think you point it out. Like, always be honest when you point out history. He sails for Ferdinand and Isabella. Part of the reason he sails is as a missionary. Spain is very, very upset. Right? They got a lot of, on their eastern flank, they got Muslims, they got the Ottoman Empire, they got real concerns. They want more Christians. That's part and parcel of what happened in that century. Again, did he mistreat Indians? Yes. Did 90% of the Indians, or the indigenous people, you can, you go back and forth, by the way, I've talked, talked to many people in tribes who say, please use Indians, just saying. Did 90% of them die from diseases? Yes. Which happens, which happens when big populations move in big ways. Happened in Africa, happened in China, in Asia, other parts of Asia, has happened in many, many ways. Is it a myth that Columbus and his men deliberately brought over smallpox blankets to give to the Indians? It is a myth. Most people had no idea how diseases were transmitted. These are people who would put leeches on their neck to bleed out. This notion that you somehow knew that there were these microbe parasitic ob um, organisms that would cause them to deliberately give diseases to indigenous people is incorrect historically. Its enslavement is terrible. It is. Exploitation of indigenous people is terrible. So you tell the whole story. Now, on the indigenous people side, did they do wonderful things in artwork, in music, in culture? Yes. Fantastic. There's some great Native American museums around. Indigenous people museums are fabulous. Totally get it. However, when we tell the indigenous people story, do we say they enslaved other indigenous peoples? They raped women almost as a matter of course daily. They ripped hearts out of victims as part of their human sacrifices here. Do we tell that part of the indigenous story, people? Yes, we do. Don't we want an honest portrayal of history on both sides? That's my argument. So I say, do them both. I, whether it's the same day or a different day, I think that's fine. Do them both and just be honest and tell the story. Why do we want to? Why do we want to romanticize indigenous people any more than we want to romanticize Columbus? Is it just because they're indigenous people? That feels weird to me as a historian to want to do that. So my advice to you, I mean. Listen, I know I'm going to probably get drummed out of certain organizations here saying this, but my advice to you is to do both and just be honest with the history of both. I feel like that's a simple answer. You don't have to absolutely decry somebody who 500 years ago, by the way, I'll tell you what it's called. 
the arrogance of presentism. Know what it means? It means that everybody who came before us didn't know what they were doing, who were jerks, they were racist, they were misogynists, they were this, they were that, they were that. Be careful, because 200 years from now, I don't know what they're going to be saying about us. <laughs> 500 years from now, I don't know what they're going to be saying about us. So I'm just saying be careful of that. That's all. That's my speech. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yes.